previous speaker talked about this a little bit, but uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, using Go as a web development uh, platform. So uh, I kind of assume you know a little bit about Go. Going through the, yes, the, the, the previous uh, class would probably be enough, but uh, that's about as far as I, as I assume. And even if you don't know Go, some other languages will probably at least you'll be able to understand what I'm going on, what's going on. All right, so just a few reasons why Go is great. Uh, it's because it's, uh, it's nice to have a statically typed language that, uh, that you know, keeps you from making dumb mistakes. But at the same time, it stays out of your way. It feels kind of like Python or some other duct type language when you're using it. And of course, it's a clear and consistent style. You got Go format. The compiler doesn't have warnings. It only has errors. So you'll never actually write something that works, but it's dumb. And uh, at least the syntax is familiar, somewhat like C. And um, one of my favorite things about Go is because the, the, it produces compiled static binaries. Deployment's a breeze. Like you don't have to do, <laughs> with, with a lot of our Python projects, you know, you just you have to do the pip install and, and make sure all the other dependencies are already installed before you do that. And then it compiles everything, and then it's ready to go. But something breaks, and it just it takes like an hour to deploy a, a new version. Whereas with Go, it takes like five seconds, because it's already compiled and ready to run. Also, Go is cool because it has the, it's the only language with a cute mascot. <laughs> OK, so this is going to be not so much a presentation as a little bit of an interactive kind of thing. At least I, I hope so. <laughs> um, so what you will need is you'll need either a computer with Go installed, or I'll show you how to get one if you need one, and, uh, and an editor, of course. Um, if you know Go a little bit, uh, that'll help. And uh, we'll just be using curl to, do our, to be our web browser, but uh, you can use a regular one if you like, I suppose. And uh, just as a quick start, if you don't have Go installed on your machine already, if you have Docker, you can do this. Docker run uh, golang and just give it a command, something like bin bash to run. And you will have Go installed within a couple of minutes. Um, or you can log in this server that I made. It is, uh, so just use SSH, log in as go at 107.170.253.202.0. The password is, all lowercase, openwest2015. I'll leave that up if anybody wants to get onto it, just for a second. But once you've logged into that, you'll be on a, uh, um, on a server with a installed uh, Go system ready to roll. Um, and I'll just kind of demonstrate that really fast, actually. So it'll just be SSH go at 107.170. If I can see what I'm typing here. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, if I can remember how to do that on this terminal. Nope, not on this terminal. <laughs> Whoops, I just killed my presentation, I think. Hang on a second. Nope, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. It's called DWM. It's from Suckless. <laughs> and I forgot a couple of the commands for it. So I will use this editor, which I can totally zoom in on this one. There we go. All right. Just And password again is open, open west 2015. And once you're in, just say who you are and ta da. And now Go is there. You're ready to roll. So you can do something like, you know, go get some, uh, some tools that you might need. And it just works. All right, and we shall continue. So anybody else, any, everybody who's gotten on that is on there? OK. OK, so the very basics of, and this, this is um, what our, the previous talk talked about a little bit, the basic tool you use for web development in Go is the net slash HTTP package, which provides building blocks that you need for writing a web client or a web server. Um, 
it's a, it's a very nice web client library, actually. It's a, I've used it compared to like Python requests or the like. And it's just as easy to use. Gets, and you can hit remote web servers very nicely with NetHttp. But running a server is actually also very easy and very powerful. So there's the very basic uh, hello world web server that you will find in a, 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 for a Go system. We have imported NetHttp. And then we've created a type here, hello world handler, which is a, uh, in this case, it's an empty struct. You can add stuff to it if you want to. Um, but this hello world handler uh, has a single method, serve HTTP, which implements the HTTP uh, dot handler interface. OK, that better? <laughs> Sorry about my low contrast. I, I like solarized. It's my favorite color scheme. Maybe it's not great for slides. <laughs> anyway, so, so there you go. So HTTP handler has a single method, serve HTTP. And I'm sh hoping everyone's familiar with what an HTTP method is, uh, H a Go, not an HTTP method, a Go interface. You just implement any of the methods that that interface requires, and Bing, you implement the interface. So this is how we are implementing the HTTP handler interface. And so serve HTTP is a function that takes a couple of arguments. One is a response writer interface, which also implements the uh, writer interface, um, just the regular old io.writer interface, so you can write bytes to it. And, uh, and uh, voila. Also, there's a pointer to a request object, which has things like whatever the URL was, and the contents of the request, and, uh, and various other little things that you might need, and also some methods for things like uh, parsing a form and stuff like that. So, so here what we do, basically the only thing our handler does is it writes the bytes hello world to the response writer. And then at the very bottom in our main method, we run listen and serve. We give it a port number to run. And, uh, and then uh, we tell it, and we give it a handler. You can give it a nil handler, and it'll do some fancy magic for you. But in this case, we're explicitly giving it our new world handler. So we just call new on there so we can pass in a pointer so that it satisfies the interface. OK. So let's try it out. Let's, uh, so on your machine, write this file out. Um, I'm going to do the same thing on my box here. And th then we will watch how it goes. Um. So do you know, is this multi-threaded? It is multi-threaded. Here's how it works um, with an HTTP handler. The, the handler serve HTTP function is called as a Go routine by the library. Okay. Every request that comes in, it is called as a Go with the Go keyword in front of it passing in that response writer interface and the request object, the request pointer. So every request runs in its own Go routine. So you have to make sure that anything that is accessed by a handler is done in a thread safe way. Either you use channels or you use locks. You have to do everything in a thread safe way from a handler if you're accessing global stuff. Um, and so So yeah, so here if we uh, I, I, I have one of them, but not this hello world in, in this Git repo. So we're going to just type this out really fast. Why is that all screwy off to one side? Yeah, OK. And then. Yeah, I did that just to make it fit in the width of the it, it, Go format. Still liked it, so I guess it's still valid. <laughs> All right, and then we can just you know make our type, and it doesn't have to be a struct. I mean, let's make it uh, an integer in this case because we're not actually doing anything with it. Because you know this is Go, you can you can subtype any type you like, and. Uh, and so I cannot type <laughs> while people are watching. This has been a, there we go, tab complete does the job. Yeah, I should have put this in a 
I should have put this accessible somewhere so we didn't have to type it out. And then so, and you can call it whatever you want. I just always call it W because it's shorter. <laughs> and then And so now we can just write the bytes, casting a string to a byte array. I will learn how to type someday. OK. And then I promise this is going to be the last of typing up like this. At least, unless we start making stuff up as we go along. <laughs> Does the response writer need to be pointer as well? No, because interfaces under the hood are pointers. So since it's an interface, it uh, it's already a pointer. Okay. And then let's just do this. I have to do it that way because I made it a subclass of int instead of a empty struct. And then uh, okay, go format, clean it up a little bit. OK, well, <laughs> whatever. Maybe I do need to do a struct. Maybe maybe I'm making things up here. That you maybe you have to use tabs. No, you don't have to use tabs. And go, go format will turn it into tabs anyway. Go, go space format. <laughs> OK, it's running, but <laughs> oh, that's weird. <laughs> it doesn't work in Tmux. <laughs> OK, and now we can do what we were trying to do the whole time. It worked. There. <laughs> so that's your, that is your uh, basic hello world and go. So that's what I just did there. We made our file, we ran it, and there we go. But so that's just the very bare basics. You, rate, you, you create a handler that implements the HTTP.handler interface. And, uh, and you create a handler interface and pass it to listen and serve. But there's a lot more that you can do. Um, and there's a lot of frameworks that, that take advantage of that basic handler interface. Um, I put at the top the net slash HTTP, which is the standard library, because there's a lot more it does than what I just did. It has a, a muxer where you have like a URL router built into it, basically a handler that then launches other handlers um, based on the URL. Uh, Gorilla is another library. Yeah, on top of net HTTP, it has Gorilla is a collection of libraries. It's not really a framework. Every little piece of Gorilla doesn't really depend on the other pieces, so you can use them all on your own. So there's like a Muxer, and there's a Context, and there's a, a middleware stack, and there's um, um, and there's things to like parse uh, form inputs into structs and stuff like that. There's a lot of stuff in Gorilla. It's very nice. And another one that used to be very popular, I think it still is, but uh, there's, there's been some newer ones from the same developer, it's not maintained anymore, is Martini. And Martini provides 
Martini gives you almost the same kind of framework as you would have with Sinatra in Ruby or with um, or, or Flask in Python, a bare bones micro framework, but still very, it's got things like uh, dependency injection and stuff like that that you don't, don't get in a lot of the other frameworks. But uh, Martini has basically been end of life and has been replaced by the same developers by another project called Negroni, which doesn't give you much more than middleware. Um, one of my favorites is GoCraft slash web. Uh, GoCraft slash web is a very thin wrapper on top of NetHttp. The handlers look almost identical. Um, but uh, you can, uh, but it does have middleware and it has contexts that are not based on maps. They're based on structs, so they're a bit faster than what you'd get with Gorilla, which uses a, a global map for its contexts and can be kind of slow. Um, there's also Revel and Bigo. Both of these are big, full-featured uh, web frameworks that don't really uh, follow the same paradigm as net slash HTTP. They follow a, a paradigm maybe more similar to something like structs in Java, or maybe sometimes even closer to, to Rails or to Django. Um, so th those are the big boys, the Revel and Bigo. I haven't messed with them much because they just don't really fit with net, net HTTP, but they are there if you want to use something a little more fully featured. Um, so here, here's, here's my example that's up there online now. So that, um, that URL just goes straight to, uh, that, that, that URL will just download it, uh, the, the raw code straight to your machine. And uh, if you want to use your phone, there's a QR, but that probably just leads to frustration, as XKCD has, has told us. <laughs> but, uh, so here, I'm going to copy this and paste it into our workspace here. Ah. See? Oh, come on. There we go. Now we have color. <laughs> All right. So, um, and if did everyone want to get that uh, that URL there with the. So grab the, the code there. Everybody got that? Anyone still downloading it? OK. All right, so this we see we is, we've got a few more modules that we've imported here. We got a couple of things for parsing strings and bytes, uh, byte arrays. We've got a base64 library. We've got format and log. Um, we've got net HTTP. We also have database SQL. We'll be using SQLite with this um, as a uh, um, database uh, interface. Uh, there's here we also import GoCraft Web, which we'll be using for this uh, demonstration. Here's a, another thing about, here's something about how database drivers work in Go. So you have database slash SQL, which is the uh, main library for, uh, for interacting with any kind of SQL database. It just kind of gives you almost like, I guess, a JDBC kind of, uh, I don't know anything about JDBC, but it's a standard interface. All of your databases will have the same methods. And uh, then you just have to import the driver to power database slash SQL. But you have to import it as underscore, otherwise it won't import because you can't have unused imports in Go. So that's kind of a way around it. All right, so here we've got our global variable is the database. You don't have to do it that way. I totally keep hitting the wrong keys here. You don't have to do it that way, but that works for us today. So at the very top here, we have the init function. In Go, you, in any package, you can have an init function or any number of init functions. They will all run before main gets run. So here, we're just uh, setting up our global database uh, um, thing. So we're just saying SQL open. We're opening SQLite 3 driver that we had imported earlier. And we are setting the file to be db.sqlite3. You can set it wherever you like. And so, and then we also have a little bit of DDL. We're just going to create a single table called users, which has two columns, username and password. Don't store 
passwords in clear text ever. So uh, <laughs> I'll hunt you down and show you what happens <laughs> when you store passwords in clear text. But we're just doing it today for fun. <laughs> OK, and so now the way GoCraft Web works is you create a struct called a context, which you then attach all of your methods and your middleware to. So here we've set a con we've created a context called root context, and uh, and then we've created a method which we're going to use as a handler on that context called register, and we'll go over that in a minute. But basically, what it does is it uh, parses the form data from the from the context, and uh, and just saves it into the database. I mean. We don't have a proper model view controller paradigm going on here, but um, I, you're welcome to set something up like that or some completely different paradigm. In this case, we're kind of doing it just kind of by the seat of our pants. All of our SQL is inside of our, our view. Bad idea, but at least it works for a, uh, for a demonstration. And then here we have another context. This one embeds the root context. This one's called user context. And this one's called user context because it uh, requires all of the, it's going to use middleware to, um, authenticate before it runs any of the handlers and that middleware is going to authenticate a user. So but it has two fields. It's got embedded the root context that we had before because this one's going to be a subcontext in all the URLs of well it's it, it's kind of a tree structure of contexts and this one is uh, a a context that inherits from the root context. Not any inherits because this is go. There's no inheriting, but there is embedding. And um, and it also has one field username of whoever has logged in. And then we have our middleware. Middleware takes, um, it, unlike a regular handler, it, it, it does take a response writer and a request. Oh, these start with web instead of net, HTTP, just because um, GoCraft web wraps them ever so slightly with a couple of extra features. But, and that's why you, but they're basically still the same thing as HTTP response writers and requests. But it also has one more argument which is called next, which is a next middleware function, which is basically just a handler. Um, you pass in you know, the W and the R when you want to run whatever the next middleware or the actual final handler. So that's what that does. So yeah, I'm using goto. I probably could have used a, a closure, but just for error handling, really, this is, which is what effective Go says you should use gotos for anyway. So. So this it just uh, it re this middleware reads the authorization header and it does basic auth. I just basic auth is so easy to implement. You just uh, first it has to start with basic. If it doesn't, it doesn't work. And uh, you decode base64 decode the rest of the header after the, the word basic, and uh, and it's it's divided by a colon and into username and password. And then all I have to do is just select from the database the username and password and if it exists then then they're logged in we set the the context which is passed in as the because this is a method on the context we set the username on the context and then we call next and it goes on to whatever other middleware is registered or um, or into the actual handler and uh, all other cases it ends up going into this unauthorized block where it uh, sets a WW authenticate header and returns with a status 401, status unauthorized. So that's, that's our middleware. And then here we have a handler that uh, is called make something. And it reads the form, gets the whatever the what on the form is. And uh, so. And then if that something is T, then it says, if it's not T, then it says I'm, I'm a teapot and returns status 418. Otherwise, it says it's making a nice pot of tea. So let's run this and watch what happens. And I will, I will learn that I'm using default tea mugs characters somehow. There we go, there we go. Um, All right, and then we do Oh, we got a problem. We have not uh, gotten Go SQLite 3. But I think we can fix that just like this. 
Oh, never mind. Um. So. You know, you do all trial runs and stuff, and everything seems to work, and then it never works <laughs> when you actually go and do it. Yeah, this one's a little bigger than GoCraft Web. It's probably compiling it too. But uh, before before I run it, I guess anyone have any questions? I guess I forgot to cover the bottom here. Oop. Yeah, so here in the main function, there's a couple of things. We create an instance of our router context using web.new. So it's not, this isn't actually an instance of our router of our root context struct, it, it struct is actually an in instance of a GoCraft web router. But we're saying we want to use that type as our uh, instance, and it'll reflect on it and figure out what it needs to do with it. And then we say that when you post to the URL slash register, we want to use the function root context dot register as the handler. And, uh, and then we create a sub router of router called auth router and it uses the user context that we created and it uh, and we're we're sending it off of, of slash but you can set a, a, um, a root within your your tree for any one of your sub routers and uh, and then we're registering a middleware on that router for the authenticate middleware uh, method on our user context and then we say on post to slash make we'll run the make something handler and then at the very bottom, we just do a listen and serve and pass in the router, the root router, as our, as our handler. So that's all you have to do. OK, now it should run. Yes, it's running. OK, and so if we do. It's register, right? So then we can just do username equals, yeah. Then I just put my name. And oh, whoops. <laughs> I don't think dash F does what I think it does in. H to send a URL encoded form field. Um, just uh, set headers. Oh, I don't need to set headers. I just need to send a URL encoded. No, that's raw. I think it's, I think it's that one actually. Okay. Yep. I'll learn to type someday, especially when I can't see it. Is that right? No. <laughs> What's wrong? OK. So it worked. And now if we do, and let's do this so we can see what the full response is. is not authorized. Oh, well, that's because I haven't set the username and password. It looks like our middleware works. So we can set the username and password because it's basic auth. We can just do it, set it like this. It says, I can't make a sandwich. I am a teapot. Sent to 418. 
if anybody knows their RFC, uh, you know, April Fool's jokes, the 418, I'm a teapot for the coffee control protocol. Anyway, so it can't make, it can't make a sandwich because it's a teapot. Well, okay, if it's a teapot, maybe it can make, uh, it says it can't make coffee either. Well, what the heck do you make in a teapot? Oh, okay, you make tea. <laughs> okay, and, and that's about it. Now, let, let me double check something here. Oh, we don't have that. But if we, let's take a look at that database. Uh, there, yeah, so the database part is working, obviously. And we, that's, so that's the little demo you have with GoCraft Web, you can create middleware that will allow uh, groups of uh, handlers to, to interact in a, in a kind of a stack based way. And uh, you can also, with database SQL Lite, uh, with, with database slash SQL, you can interface with any SQL database. It works perfectly well with PostgreSQL and with, uh, and with MySQL or whatever. And so that's, that's basically the gist of this little demo of web-based Go development. Um, a lot of the advantages of Go, I, I don't think they're <laughs> I don't think I've actually highlighted here because uh, some, just because a lot of them are like data processing focused. A lot of the time, what I'll do is my handler won't actually synchronously process something. Instead, it will take whatever the re the request is and then pass it into a Go routine into a channel that to some other Go routine to actually process it, and then that Go routine will have. That, uh, that channel will probably actually go to several Go routines in like a worker pool format. And they'll process it, and they'll, they'll insert things into the database, or they'll query the database, or they'll do whatever math they need to do, regular expressions, who cares, right? They'll do all the processing. And then maybe this handler will block and wait and then return something useful to the user, or maybe it won't. It'll, maybe it'll just return a 202 accepted and say, uh, yeah, we got your, your information, and uh, you can go and get the results somewhere else later. But um, we can have basically these pipelines and these worker pools all in the Go system, all in, all in your one binary, um, which, is, which is very nice, I believe. Uh, or you can have some things in line you, you can return. Like maybe uh, you do all your processing in your handler, but then you, you pass it off to a different Go routine to actually insert it into the database so that you can return as soon as possible the uh, results to the user. Um, that, that's just some of the things that uh, that uh, that we can do here so and uh, so yeah this is this is just very basic how, how go can be used as a as a web server uh, part of the advantage is you can just compile this into a static binary upload it to a server and run it and it just works um, and yeah, there's a lot of other little tools, like thing, uh, things that you can have that'll auto reload your, like recompile and, re and rerun your code automatically. Tools like Jin and uh, um, Compile Daemon. But uh, that's about it. Uh, what else? What else do you? Is there anything else you'd like to see? Any more? Anything you'd like to see more detail of? Uh, I just have a question. So um, the response writer dot write method is what returns the response body. Um, does it send the response immediately on the right call, or can you call right multiple times and once your routine exits, will they send it? Will they send, send the response then? You can set it up to use chunk transfer, so that every time you run a write, it will send immediately, and it'll send it in a chunk instead of setting you know a content length header. Um, but so here, when you run write header, after that, basically all that you can do is write. Anything else you try to do the response writer, you shouldn't do because now you've set whatever the response code is going to be. Okay. Um, and above that, you like um, here. Let's go to our middleware here. In our uh, in our unauthorized here, like the w dot header method returns the headers because it's an interface. It has to be a method. Um, and then, uh, but then that returns a header object, and you can run dot set on it. So we can set the www authenticate header and uh, say that we're using basic auth. Um, 
It's because, you know, according to the RFCs, if you use a 401 return code, you have to set a WW Authenticate header, so that's why I did that. And um, so, but you can't do w.header.set before you, after you do write header, because, well, it's already written the headers, to the wire. And then it can start to do, and then once you do, do start doing writes, sometimes it'll block it up, and sometimes it'll, it'll do a chunk transfer. You have to, I can't, I have to look at the docs. <laughs> but right. speaking of docs, actually, let's, uh, one of the, so your, your best friend, whenever you're doing Go, is always this website, uh, the uh, um, godoc.org. So I can go to something like, and there we go. There's all the documentation for GoCraft Web, and uh, that's just fine and dandy. Anyway, other questions? I mean, we still have a bit of time. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Um, it's kind of regarding the asynchronicity and concurrency. Yes, yes, um, that's good. So I've been kicking around with build lately. Mm -hmm. Run into a lot of race conditions and like seeing callbacks or promises. Is there something similar? Like, is it a different paradigm? Yeah. Like yeah, OK. So the question is, like, how, how is Go's asynchronous uh, paradigm different from Node? That basically what you're saying? Yeah. yeah, so Node, it does have the reactor pattern with callbacks and with uh, events. Uh, event an event-driven reactor pattern. Uh, Go, it's kind of a hybrid of a reactor pattern and threads. So every, so it's basically an event whenever a, re a request comes in, and that event launches a Go routine, which is a thread, essentially a thread. And so any blocking call you do in that thread will only block that Go routine, and it will then yield, and other Go routines can run in the same process. Nope. Uh, there are many different calls that will block any I.O. Uh, writes and reads to channels. All of those block. And so you can just let it run top to bottom like regular old blocking code. But because it's in a Go routine in the handler, it won't, uh, it won't block any of the other Go routines. Oh. And so, so if it's just smart enough to know that if, uh, hey, I'm doing something that's going to leave some idle resources. So then it'll just use them. Simple. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, so that's um, yeah, that, that's 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 that is quite nice. And it's, it, like I, I have used not Node per se. Uh, I use a lot of Node tools, Grunt, Gulp, whatever, for like for front end development. But for but I haven't really used Node much for back end. But but yeah, a lot of the even in the browser, a lot of the time JavaScript, you got to deal with all these promises and all of these callbacks just just to make sure that things happen in the order you expect them to. And and they, yeah, whereas in Go the uh, it's going to happen in the order you, writ you wrote it. Um, if you use buffered channels or, or, um, or things like that, things can start to happen in funky orders. But usually, you don't care. And that's why you're using a buffered channel in the first place. I don't care if this one goes first or that one goes first, as long as something goes. You know? And uh, oh, and all right, one more thing. A cool thing, another, you can do front end development in Go on the web. You can use, there's a, there's a library, uh, a project out there called Gopher.js which uh, is pure Go, it compiles into JavaScript, and it has like, all the features you can want. Like, all the net HTTP client library actually works. You don't have to deal with XHRs and callbacks and stuff like that. It's kind of cool. The only real problem with it is it ends up kind of big, because it has to compile a whole bunch of the Go standard library into JavaScript. But other than that, it's kind of cool. <laughs> but, so you can do, you do front and back end in Go if you were so inclined. Um, so if you're doing something like raw nginx, then that's going to nginx is really really fast for serving static files or acting as a proxy and stuff like that. You usually don't want to do that in Go, but because Go is a uh, it is a um, static it, it is a garbage collected language, just like uh, Java is a gar garbage collected language, and you do have the problem that up to the current version of Go. That, uh, that garbage collector is not uh, concurrent, so it will stop the world on you now and again. So it's not perfect for true real time, where you need guaranteed delivery within like microseconds. But, uh, but it's, sti it's still, compared to Python, compared to Ruby, compared to Node, 
Because it's bare metal, because you have a lot more control over how memory is used, you have real arrays instead of um, always having linked lists or, or hash maps and uh, those kinds of things, and you have real structs, things are much more compact in memory. That, uh, that leads it to being um, a much faster language than Python or Ruby, um, where it's about par with Java. It still doesn't beat C++, but it's not really supposed to because it has more features and like more memory management features and stuff than C++. But uh, I, when I rewrite something from Python to Go, I usually see 100x speedups. That's what I'm looking at. Oh, yeah. and you can easily hit the 10k concurrent requests bar with Go pretty easily. Yeah. And so then, yeah, what is next? Yeah, so here's a few more packages that you'll probably want to learn as you explore using Go in web. Um, the encoding slash JSON module, which I use all the time, I didn't cover today. Um, so with that, with that encoding slash JSON module, this is the JSON uh, uh, serializing and deserializing tool in Go. Um, sometimes it might feel a little clunky because you have to write structs to match whatever the data is going to be written or read. Usually that's just fine because you're not dealing with super dynamic JSON. Uh, but if you are, it starts to get kind of crunky, but it is super fast. Uh, all the benchmarks I've seen in coding slash JSON is basically the fastest uh, JSON library there is. Another library is HTML slash template, which I haven't used much, but it has a built-in template, something like what you might find with like uh, uh, Jinja or Django in Python or Mustache or Handlebars in JavaScript, so it has a, it has a, a library for doing HTML templates. Uh, again, Gorilla, uh, there's tons of stuff in there that, that work really well with basically all the different HTTP libraries in Go. Um, also, anything on the golang.org slash x is not standard library, but it's still written by the Go team. So the x slash net slash websocket library provides websockets for real time, like push from the server to the browser kind of support, and that works very well. It's uh, uh, as far as writing WebSocket code. I've tried it with Twisted on Python. Uh, and it, I know it's pretty easy on, on Node, but, uh, but on Go, it's, it's just a breeze to be able to handle WebSockets. Basically, it's kind of event-driven. You, you register a function for every message, and that just runs in a Go routine, and you process it, and off you go. Uh, some other neat, neat tools. Uh, another neat tool is uh, NSQ. The NSQ.io, they're uh, uh, kind of like RabbitMQ or something like that. They're a, a, a job queue. Um, but it's written in Go, and also it has a Go library. So that if you want to make it distributed like a cluster instead of just a single box with tons of worker Go routines in it, like maybe you need to spread it out to a lot of boxes, Go NSQ is probably your, your game there. And also Negroni, compared to GoCraft Web, is probably one of the best uh, libraries available. And uh, so yeah, there's, there's tons more to research. Uh, take a look at any of one of these on GoDoc or, or just look them up. And uh, so yeah, just basically in conclusion, you're, uh, you'll find that Go really gives you just about everything you need to write a fast and powerful web service. And so go ahead, start today and start making a nice fast Go service. And uh, if you want, there's a speaker deck link. <laughs> Thank you.
Um, does that use less memory than Python? Yes, it does. Mostly because Python has a lot of boxing around its uh, variables. It uses hash maps all the time. Like a class is a hash map. It's basically a dictionary. Whereas a struct is nicely packed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you'll you'll find you'll find it, especially memory use compared to um, com e CPU use might not necessarily be a lot less. It should be, but not necessarily be a lot less than Python. You usually see the major gains in memory use. Yeah. And then, uh, are, did you link your slides into the joined in stuff? Uh, I I will. Good. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> and then you said, talked about that that RabbitMQ thing. NSQ. N NSQ. Yeah. And because uh, you put N O S Q or something. I did. Well, there's Go NSQ. Go NSQ. Okay. Yeah. But it's just NSQ.io is the actual service. Go NSQ is the client. NSQ. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. That's interesting to me because we use Python. Considered 